a million containers isn't cool. Do you know what's cool? A hundred containers. My name's Chris, and today I'm going to be talking about containers in the small. I work at a payments company called GoCardless as a site reliability engineer. And to be frank, we're no Google or Amazon or Twitter. We do not have hashtag web scale traffic. So why would we even care about containers? Let's start by looking at what we are. We're a payments API. Merchants make requests like this, post to cash monies, amount 100. We take money out of their customer's account, transfer it to them, and everyone's happy. Because of what we are, we have a relatively high value on each request. Any failed request can cause the merchant to lose a customer, particularly if it was part of a checkout flow. Even if it wasn't and the customer comes back, merchants tend to just expect payments to work. It's kind of like electricity or plumbing. So for us, reliability is key. If our API goes down, merchants start to lose money, and if we do that for them too often, then we lose the merchants. So today, I'm going to focus on one part of reliability. I'm going to focus on the ability to deploy new versions of software reliably. I'm going to look at how we use containers to do that better. And I'm going to look at some other options that kind of give you something similar to what we did, but that might fit different orgs in a better way. But first things first, before we launch into containers and how to manage them, I want to talk about deployment artifacts. Now, a deployment artifact is something where you take your source code out of a repository like Git or Mercurial or whatever, and you turn it into something which you can put on all your servers. You'll have heard of many examples of these. If you're on the JVM, you'll use jar files. You may have statically linked binaries from a language like Go, or use operating system packages like DEBs or RPMs. All of these give you something which you can take and put on all your servers, configure, and run your app. Sadly, not every language starts on an equal footing here. Not everything has such a strong notion of an artifact. As a mostly Ruby shop, we cared a lot about you know, having artifacts for Ruby applications. And it turns out that the Ruby ecosystem doesn't start you in a great place. So let's look at a typical Ruby deployment flow using a tool called Capistrano. The default flow that Capistrano ships with looks like this. On each server, you clone the source code. You build your dependencies. You run schema migrations against the database from one server. You build static assets, CSS, HTML, whatever it is you need. Then you send SIGHUP to your web server, and it reloads the new code in. So what's wrong with that? There's a ton of hope involved. The entire process relies on hope. <laughs> and now, like, hope is a great thing to have in life, but it's not a desirable property of a software system. So looking at that flow again, I mean, assuming we don't mess around with Git history, cloning is kind of probably going to work, so I'll give it a free pass for now. Building dependencies definitely relies on hope. Like, some of the errors you get while you're doing this are literally notorious if you're a Ruby developer. One of them is this. You hit bundle install, which is the way to install Ruby dependencies, and you get an error that's like building Nokogiri using system libraries, and then boom, this failed because I couldn't like, compile against the native stuff on your system. Now, this happens all the time, and you really want to deal with it before your app goes anywhere near a real environment, even staging, like not even talking production here. So we want to avoid doing that as part of our deployment flow. The next one, which looks kind of similar, is building static assets. For all the same reasons that a deploy might fail to build dependencies, your static assets may fail as well. That you may have changed a version of the dependencies, which causes the static build to fail. Again, we want to move it out of the deployment flow. Lastly, and kind of most scarily, is the SIG hub. You send that to one of your Ruby web servers, like Unicorn or Puma. It loads in the new code, and then maybe that code will actually serve requests. The old code is gone, and if it doesn't serve requests, you are now in a horrible situation. And there's something that I cribbed out of the SRE book, which is this saying of hope is not a strategy. Now, I'm not trying to throw shade at Capistrano. Like, tons of Ruby shops have used it for years, and it like, kind of works. But we wanted to build some more reliable way of deploying our code. And there's something else. And that is that applications don't run in a vacuum. What do I mean by that? Say you've got your Ruby app. It's got some libraries written in Ruby that you depend on. 
And in turn, those depend on some native dependencies on the machine. If we make a little bit of space, we can look at a concrete example, the one I mentioned earlier, of Nokagiri, which depends on libxml2. Nokagiri is a Ruby library for working with XML documents, and it binds into the native C library, libxml2, which is present on a lot of systems. Both of these things need to be installed for your Ruby app to work, which leaves us with a question. How do we install software? Like, this seems like the dumbest question in the world. It's like, yeah, app get install or whatever. Like, I don't care, just install it. But it's relevant. We've got two things to install. Nokagiri comes through that Ruby tool called Bundler. Native dependencies tend to come from something like app get or some sort of RPM-based install mechanism, the native OS package manager. These are usually controlled by two different code bases in your organization. Your language dependencies, such as Nokagiri, end up in the source repository of your app code, whereas libxml2 is in like some config management like Chef or Puppet or whatever. And then that's kind of inconvenient. Like, in most orgs, the SRE team tends to look after the um, config management code base, and you'll have separate dev teams, each with their own application code bases. Even if you're in an org where that's the same team managing both, your definition of like the things you depend on is split apart. You have to remember to update those two things in lockstep and make sure you don't pick incompatible versions and so on and so forth. So it turns out that container images are totally a thing that exists. Tools like Docker allow you to describe how to assemble your application into a deployable unit right down to the native libraries you depend on from the operating system. So it means you turn this into this. And I would say that this is why most companies care about Docker. Now, I'm not speaking about companies like Google or Amazon or whoever who are trying to optimize the use of their compute. We're talking about small companies who just want to deploy stuff and have it work. So really, they don't care about Linux primitives like namespaces and C groups all that much. But people flocked to Docker as soon as they saw what they could do with images. Now, if you want the clickbait version of this opinion, is that Docker is a fat jar for people who aren't using the JVM. Cool. I've got all that off my chest now. So I can talk about what we did at GoCardless and how containers helped us. Given that I just spent 50 slides or so talking about deployment artifacts, you can probably guess at the things we cared about. First off, we wanted a uniform way to deploy software. That is a concrete definition of a deployable unit. And we wanted to use that unit to deploy as much of our software as possible across our systems. We wanted build artifacts. We wanted an identical thing that you would ship to every environment and would be past config to make it be different per environment. And we wanted to define that inside each app's code base so that teams could manage their own um, deployment artifacts. And we also wanted to fail early in any step possible. Anything like installing dependencies or generating assets could be done during build rather than deployment, and we would know when things broke sooner. So what didn't we care about? I think this is really important, like in any project you're doing, is to define like what are your non-aims? What are you not going to do? Because like it's super easy to get distracted when you start on a project and you haven't said like we're excluding these things. If you can define what you're not doing, you'll avoid distractions. And for us, the big one was we avoided distributed schedulers, by which I mean tools like Mesos and Kubernetes. These are things designed to schedule processes onto homogeneous sets of servers. So let's say you have a large fleet of computers, like five or 10,000 or something, and they have the ability to run programs through some standard interface. A scheduler knows how to assign tasks to those computers. So if we ask it to run a web app for us, and for there to be at least three copies, it may do something like this or this. The point is, when you're using a scheduler, you stop thinking about exactly where your application is running, because with a large enough fleet, that's impractical. It's a really cool idea, but nothing comes for free. Taking the example of Kubernetes, you probably need to understand at least these things to have a sensible deployment of it. You need to understand its distributed scheduler, how it's going to move your processes about, when it will do that, what will cause it to change things. There's also cluster DNS. Kubernetes optionally, can assign names to each of your services that are running. Most people use this component of Kubernetes, and you want to know how it's going to work, 
whether those names are going to expire and when, and just generally have a grasp of what it's going to do to you in production. And lastly, there's a part called etcd, which is a distributed state store that Kubernetes uses to store all its config. And it turns out distributed databases are kind of hard to run. Now, even if you've got it working in a steady state, you need to be thinking about things like having a working, tested backup and restore procedure for it. Restore is important, backup less so. And I've just scratched the surface. There's plenty more to learn if you want to actually run Kubernetes for real in production. So, given that nothing comes for free, and we're not hashtag web scale, we decided that distributed schedulers were something we could leave out. So, what did we end up with? There are three parts. First off, we needed some way to define a service that was going to run in an environment. Now, a service comprises of a container image, that build artifact that I mentioned earlier, some environment config that should be passed into the service, a command to run, such as start background worker or serve API, some limits that you may want to specify on there, such as how much memory or CPU the service can use, and some other bits and pieces like which server it should run on and so on. Now, what is this problem? It's config management, again. So we put it into Chef. Like, we already had Chef, and we wanted to make this like, move to a new deployment architecture as non-risky as possible. So we define our services inside Chef, and when it runs, it puts config for each one onto each of our servers. Servers don't have to run the same stack. So you could have services A and B on node 1, B and C on node 2, and A and C on node 3. And then each server knows what it should run. So once you have those service definitions on our compute cluster, we needed some tool to actually use them, something to take those and run the apps. So we built one, and it's called Conductor. The most interesting command from Conductor is this one, Conductor Service Upgrade. This is how new versions of services get into production. And the way it works is you give it a service ID, such as Go Cardless App Production, the live API server. You give it a Git revision to be deployed. And what it does under the hood is this. It starts some new containers for the new version that we're trying to deploy. It waits for those containers to pass a health check. That's a layer 7 health check. Um, so like HTTP. If that fails or times out, then we abort the deploy and leave the old version running. We rewrite config for a local instance of Nginx to say, please direct traffic to these new containers. And once we've written that config, we tell Nginx to reload, and we stop the old containers. Now, let's take a look at that a little bit more visually, just so it's clear. We've got three bits of software, Conductor, Nginx, and Docker on each of these compute hosts. Let's say we've got an old version of our service running, and it's happily serving traffic. We tell Docker to start a new version of our, of our service. We perform a health check on the service. Once that's passed, we reconfigure Nginx, tell it to reload so that traffic switches over to the new containers. Once we're happy that everything's settled, we tell Docker to shut down any old containers that are still running, and we remove them. That takes us back to a steady state. Now, Nginx here is what lets us swap out our containers without dropping requests on an individual host. This is kind of similar in principle to a blue-green deploy, but on a much smaller scale. What about background jobs, cron jobs that happen throughout the day? They look a little different to that. And again, we have a conductor command that generates and installs crons. Again, it takes a service ID and a revision that you'd like to install, and it works by calling into some code inside your app's repo. So if you place a generate cron script there that outputs a regular cron file that knows nothing about containers and runs something, let's say, scripts clean up API tokens every 30 minutes. Now, this is a job to clean out any expired tokens that are no longer needed. Conductor knows how to wrap that and install it onto the host so that each time that command runs, it happens in a container with the correct version of the software. So, that's what our orchestration tool does in a nutshell. Once you've got that, you need some way to trigger deployments. And once more, we decided that this was a piece that we could keep boring. And this was a piece we could keep in Capistrano. 
what we ended up doing was writing our own Capistrano tasks that do almost nothing except invoke conductor across the fleet, which meant that while we were migrating between our legacy infra and our new infra, developers didn't have to think about two separate deployment systems. They could keep doing their work, and they could keep deploying things that made the business more money. And one of the primary goals for me of a team like an SRE team should be to help developers do their job. We're an enablement function, and we shouldn't be getting in the way of the rest of the org doing good stuff. So job done, right? That seems like pretty much everything you need. Except there's part of the story that I didn't mention, and that is this. Sometimes computers will just be like, hey, this process died. You might get an oom kill or some other thing that causes your process to shut down. And because of this, you have a something to look after your processes. That something is known as a supervisor. When a process under supervision dies, the supervisor notices and it tries to start it again. Now, you've probably heard of a few like standard software supervisors that get excuse me, deployed on um, many Linux systems, such as Upstart, Systemd, and Runit. At least at the time we were doing this work, none of those played well with Docker, and Docker didn't particularly play well with them. Docker had its own version of service supervision, known as restart policies, but we didn't exactly get along well with any of them. The majority of them, it became hard to stop a process that had run away. For example, if you deployed a version of a binary or reconfigured it in some way that meant that it failed within a few milliseconds of starting, there was basically no way of telling Docker, hey, stop restarting that process. The reason for this is that Docker stop takes a container ID. And because of the restart policy, the container ID is changing every few milliseconds. At that point, your machine runs away from you. And maybe if you know part of its initialization involves talking to another service, DOSes that other service on your behalf. So that's unpleasant. And the other option seemed pretty naff, too. The, one of the Docker restart policies has a max retries parameter. But rather than giving you something that says, like, this is the max retries per time period, it is a hard max retries after which it will just stop bringing up that service, which is not what we want. You may have transient issues in the network or something else. And you don't want to have to go by hand into your compute fleet and say, hey, all those things that you just decided to give up on, actually, please, let's run them again. So we built a process supervisor. And uh, sorry. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, it's called Conductor Supervise. The way it works is fairly simple, fairly naive, but fits the property that we wanted. It does so by observing the current state of containers, replacing them if anything looks wrong, and trying to bring the world in line with the service definitions that are on each node. Specifically, it checks the number of running containers. It health checks each container over HTTP. Now, I just want to stop for a minute there, because like, this is a whole thing with process supervision that I think is missed by like, even most of the other process supervisors, including systemd. Just because a process is running doesn't mean it can do useful work. Like, you could have something that's there totally unable to respond to requests, but the OS hasn't killed it yet. Now, I really wish more process supervisors would have some sort of hooks that let you do stuff like this. Cool. So if either of those checks fail, we perform a restart, provision new containers, kill off the old ones. And we rate limit that to happen at most every five seconds. Now, that is every five seconds you have a check. If there is an ongoing restart, all other checks are deferred. And you know, because these things are nicely layered, we supervise it again up in um, Upstart. And that's just so that if anything goes wrong in our code, we can stop Conductor Supervise and say, like, yo, stop spinning up containers. What's going on here? We've got a bug. This was a property that for us was missing from Docker's restart policies. To be honest, though, we don't really want that piece of software. I mean, you could kind of see the grimace on my face when <laughs> I said that we wrote it. It's just like. We are not people who should be writing a process supervisor. We're a payments company, and like, I don't really want to maintain that forever. I'm hopeful that in the next year or two, there's going to be some way to just like chuck that out uh, from our stack. But it did get us over the line with the project, and we were really happy to be there. So that's what our setups looks like. But there were a few other options that have kind of appeared either at the time 
or since we did that work. And it's worth highlighting a couple of them. The first of them looks kind of similar. Uses um, a supervisor called systemd and a container manager called rocket. I mentioned earlier systemd as a process supervisor that is now actually available in pretty much every Linux distribution as of the last year or two. The container manager Rocket was in like pre 1.0 state when we were doing this work. We were in late 2015, early 2016 doing this. But one of Rocket's explicit goals is to play nice with the process supervisors that are on all our systems, such as systemd. Which means that we could actually scrap a lot of what we've written now potentially and fit Rocket and systemd into something that looks similar. So to fit our usage, we could have conductor generate systemd config instead tell systemd how to boot and supervise these containers. Systemd would then take on all the process management. We would delete conductor supervise, but there is still that issue of HTTP health checks. Like, I may be completely wrong on this, and if I am, I want someone to come out to the foyer and tell me, like, you don't care about health checking your processes this way. But I've kind of grown to like this after having it for a year in prod now. I really wish systemd would have some sort of like call this script and if it exits non-zero, like I'm gonna restart that process. If you'd rather dodge the whole world of containers and get very similar deployment properties, you can do the same with virtual machines and auto-scaling groups. Now, if you look hard enough at auto-scaling groups, they are a process supervisor, except really they're a machine supervisor. Auto-scaling groups check that you have a certain number of virtual machines provisioned in a provider like Google or Amazon. And they, if those machines fail any sort of health check, they'll bring in new ones and get rid of the old ones. Instead of containers, you have full-on virtual machines. Two like major cloud providers have everything you need to do this, and I'm sure like many, many more do as well. And there's a tool called Packer, written by a company called HashiCorp, that builds those machine images for you, and it's really nice. The only thing to be aware of is that this whole thing is a bit slower than doing the same thing with containers. Building the image is going to take longer because it has to boot a full-on virtual machine, apply all your um, packer config, and then snapshot that machine. And same for when you're booting a new version of your service, it has to boot an entire virtual machine rather than just a new process. Cool. So to round off, I want to bring up three sort of slightly meta learnings that we got along the way, except like, I felt extremely pretentious thing like meta learnings. So, here are some reckons I have. <laughs> if you take nothing else from this talk, please start referring to this emoji as the thought leader emoji, especially if someone is talking shit on Hacker News. <laughs> cool. So, my first reckon is that you should introduce new infrastructure where failure is survivable. The first things we ran in our container infrastructure didn't really matter that much. There were things like generate this analytics dashboard for internal use. And doing this gave us a chance to learn without breaking the business. Specifically, we started off with non-critical batch jobs. Once we could see that those were working fine, we moved on to background workers. Things like sending out emails to merchants, all kind of async work that, yes, we cared about and we would page about if it was broken, but it wasn't like losing our API server. Finally, we transitioned our API servers from the old system into the new one once we were really confident that it could run things reliably. My second reckon is that goal state is what matters. Orchestration systems are dealing with a constant state of flux. It is no good just firing off API calls and hoping that they will work the system into the right state. You need to set a desired state and have your system work towards it, continually checking whether or not you've reached it. To put that another way, everything might change before your next method call. You can't assume that just because you saw a process running five seconds ago, it's still going to be there when you try and perform something to it. Processes die, machines reboot, and the network is not reliable. You have to build for that. Lastly, the system isn't interesting without context. What we built doesn't mean anything without thinking about it in the context of the org that I work in. Now, I think this is why so many orgs fail to adopt new processes or technologies, particularly around deployment and orchestration kind of stuff. These tools get talked about in a very like hyped up, excited way that means that 
everything from Docker to Kubernetes to Packer to like this whole world gets lumped together and people think, we need to move our entire org to all of this all in one go right now. And it turns out those projects don't work. You wanna pare those things down to what are actually gonna solve problems for your company. Because if you try and think about the whole thing at once, then like you're not gonna have a good time. So the main thing for me is start with why. Thank you. Cool. So before I launch into any questions, I'd like to say we are hiring, <laughs> like everyone else on the planet. Uh, if you're interested in building reliable systems for payments, we'd like love to have you join us or even just to like have a chat or whatever. Now, questions. Um, you mentioned that you forewent a more advanced distributor scheduler um, like Kubernetes or Mesos. Do you think there will come a time where you're going to revisit that decision? And what do you think are the trigger points that make you go back and revisit that? So, the kind of, I think there's probably two different things that would make us revisit that decision. One of them is the advancement of those tools uh, to a place where they're easier to use and manage or like very well managed by someone else, such as like Google Kubernetes uh, engine. The other is like our needs approaching from the other side and making what we've built no longer sufficient to run our business well. Um, on the first one, I think Kubernetes is kind of getting there, particularly when you've got like hosted versions of it. Um, something we're really excited about is the, I don't know exactly what it's called right now, if it's like distributed cron or scheduled task or something, but the ability to like really reliably run uh, scheduled jobs across your um, fleet and just have it like it will be allocated somewhere and you'll find out if we fail to allocate it within a certain amount of time. That primitive is really useful to us. Because, um, okay, industry specific, but banks like to receive large files of stuff like at certain times in the day, so we want to be able to do that reliably. Um, so yeah, the, that's the kind of other side to it is running uh, cron jobs the way we do is not pleasant. Uh, it's like we're installing them onto a host. We have to like alert a lot when anything looks like it's slightly failed. So I'd rather have something like Kubernetes take that away. Uh, so yeah, kind of two sides. I'm hoping in a year or two, like everything I've just said, like no organization should build this. But this was, we started this in like mid-2015 and swapped production over to it in March 2016. Hi. Uh, it seems like the five seconds between health checks um, when you're dealing with your customer's money might even be too long where you have... Um, services taking traffic but not responding in a useful way. So how do you handle that? And by extension, can you talk a little bit about the next layer on top, like what your load balancer layer looks like and how you're directing traffic? Yeah, so again, um, we're doing the sort of a similar thing, a layer outwards using a HA proxy. Uh, so that's monitoring can each uh, host actually respond with useful content. I don't know, I can't remember off the top of my head the exact like frequency of the checks up there, but it may be a little bit tighter to just like exclude a host if it goes down. Okay, so like redispatch on HA proxy then? Uh, that's more up to the like app, the client libraries, how to handle like failure between things. Okay, thanks. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about how do you go about monitoring those containers? Because there are strategies about monitoring per container or monitoring per machine having one agent monitoring several containers. If you could elaborate on that, it would be great. <sighs> monitoring. Um, I mean, that's something that I would say we're still evolving. We, we've, we've been evolving since we like started on this work. There's a bunch of stuff that we do per container. So we want to see things like, are we constantly running into uh, like C root limits, particularly memory? Like sometimes you'll get like a bad deploy that like suddenly spikes the memory of a service by like a few hundred megs, takes it like closer to its limit. You want to know about that. We use tools like um, Datadog for that. So we ship container level metrics over to Datadog and you can put like all kinds of your usual alerts over that. Uh, we've also got a whole bunch of checks for unexpected state on one of our compute nodes. So we use a Sensu for those. 
and those are basically like, has this node exited like what we would consider normal in terms of like the containers that are on it, um, et cetera. That we've used less and less over time. That was mostly there while we were sort of figuring this stuff out and being like, huh, oh, why has the tool or Docker decided to go off in this direction? I uh, was interested in the correspondence between uh, containers and physical machines you talked about. Um, so you mentioned you're not, since you're not using a scheduler, does this mean the mapping is actually like manually configured? We actually have a file somewhere that says this container runs on machines A, C, and D. So we have uh, in Chef like a big uh, wedge of JSON because everything is JSON uh, that says like these are like you have each service definition and then it has like an array of like deploy me to these machines. Okay. And when you talked about the um, your health checking and your system, your daemon that sort of restarts jobs and stuff, it sounded like you said that you restarted everything on the machine when one of the containers had a problem. Is that accurate? Sorry, not everything on the machine. Okay. Just just the service that's flaking. Oh, okay. Cool. Thank you. No worries. I mean, I'm happy to take more questions if people have them, or like, I'm going to be about like eating lunch and stuff. So like, feel free if that is better for you. Cool.